Thanks very much, Gabe, for those uh, great pictures. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our uh, plenary speaker for this morning, Nandita Basu, Bas Basu, who is a professor of global water sustainability and eco-hydrology at the University of Waterloo, that's in Canada, in case you didn't know. And she has a joint appointment in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science and in Civil Envi and Environmental Engineering. And uh, she is very distinguished, is an Earth Leadership Fellow. I, I thought that was really great to see and is a member of the Royal Society College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. Um, her research has advanced the understanding of nutrient cycling in anthropogenic landscapes at many scales from the watershed to the regional to the global scale. And she has developed with her colleagues tools that are now being applied across Canada in the UK and uh, Environmental Protection Agency here in the United States, and has um, this work has been really powerful in quantifying the legacy nitrogen as we try to grapple with the other great biogeochemical cycle of nitrogen and how it's been altered. And I've assured her that there is, is a room full of scientists who are eager to learn about nitrogen as well as carbon. So uh, I also want to point out that she has served on many different advisory committees, including the International Joint Commission that manages or oversees the relationships between Canada and US for the Great Lakes, which is a treasured resource uh, on the North American continent. So with that, I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Nandita Basu. Abbas Basu, yes. No, thank you so much, Diane. Thank you so much, Diane. And uh, thank you everyone for inviting me today to give this talk. I am really humbled and honored. The title of the talk is From Science to Action, Can Comparative Biogeochemistry Inform Policy? I wanted to talk to you about my journey through this space. And one of the reasons I felt really honored when asked to give this talk is though I don't belong to any one of the LTER sites, everybody was asking me when I met new people, which LTER at all are you at? And I'm at none. But LTER data was kind of, this data set really launched the path that I am on today. So LTER, has a really, um, really key role to play in, in my science path. And uh, I wanted to tell you that story today, how, how that data helped me launch into the particular path that I am on today. Um, so just uh, since I'm talking stories, so I did my PhD and this is for the graduate students who sometimes worry about their paths and whether what they are doing today is relevant and what is the right path. So my PhD was on chlorinated solvents in groundwater systems and multiphase fluid flow. Nothing to do with what I do today. And at the end of my PhD, I felt that I really enjoyed the mathematical techniques that I learned and the processes, but the big picture questions did nothing for me. I really was not motivated by the questions that I was asking in that space and I wanted to change directions. And I was motivated by these large scales, global environmental problems, problems like algal blooms, hypoxia, nutrient pollution. And in that quest, I started looking into kinds of what was out there. So this is 2008, 2009 timeframe. And there was this kind of um, big influx of people talking about predictions in ungauged basins, the seminal paper by Jeff McDonald talking about moving beyond complexity of one particular watershed and looking across multiple watersheds, trying to understand what drives patterns. And one of the things that I noticed in that space 
is that while a lot of it was done in the space of water movement, so how catchments filter rainfall to get runoff, there was relatively less of it in the space of watershed biogeochemistry. And that was what's one of the things that motivated me. So I started looking at data and uh, so, so basically the main kind of thing that was, I was looking at is looking at patterns in data and using patterns to understand processes and from that space, thinking about developing models that can work across a range of scales. So the first data set that I looked at at that point in time was, of course, the easiest to access USGS NACWA data. And we looked at the Mississippi Basin and a colleague came forward with data uh, for the Baltic Sea. And we found this really strong linear relationship between loads of nitrogen and phosphorus and stream flow across multiple watersheds. Now, a couple things about this. In some ways, you would say, well, of course, it's linear load of a nutrient is dependent on discharge, and that is true. And one of the things that that relationship tells us is that concentrations are not varying as much in these watersheds. Now, what is the reason? Is it because these are large basins, so things get homogenized anyway, doesn't really matter? How do we answer this question? And in order to answer this question, this is when the LTER data became important to us. And you have to think about 2008, 2009, it was a different time, I feel, in the space of open data. We have made tremendous advancement in the last 10 years in this space. In 2008, 2009, there wasn't a lot of open data. And LTER was one of the very few open data sets where you didn't have to belong to an LTER site, you could go in and download the data. And that's what we did. This is work done in collaboration with Sally Thompson and we looked across multiple LTER sites uh, to un understand this linearity. And this is data from the Hubbard Brook watershed. I haven't shown this slide in ages now. Um, so what you see in that is sodium, and sodium has that tight linear relationship. But when you see, look at nitrate, it is a scatter plot. So there's no linear relationship between nitrate load and discharge. And what that is telling you is that concentrations are really variable in these systems. It's not, uh, the lack of variability is missing. Well, Hubbard Brook is small in terms of a catchment size. Is it a question of size? So then we found another data, which is a tile drain watershed in Midwest. And that is the LVR site, the uh, Little Vermilion River site. And we saw a strong linear relationship. This is what contributed to kind of this idea, does linearity in the relationship increase with human impact? Is there something humans are doing to this landscape to increase this linearity between load and discharge? So in order to answer this question, we then looked across multiple uh, LTER sites. What you see in that image on the left is this idea of the variability in concentration as a function of the variability in discharge. So as you increase human impact, your variability in concentration decreases. And this is the idea of humans homogenizing landscape responses. Now this is also LTER data. This is magnesium, silicon, and calcium. And here you see the variability is not that much. So these are geogenic solutes that do not show that much variability in concentration. Again, going back to the nitrogen site, nitrogen shows a lot more variability at less impacted sites. If you look at road salt as an example, here also you see a similar pattern where at the left end of that space is low impact, right end is more human impacted watershed, you see a decrease in the variability in concentration. And this is what led to this hypothesis that increasing human impact reduces the rel relative variability in concentrations or humans homogenize landscape. Now, this homogenization hypothesis is something that I uh, feel very um, strongly about. I think this is, this is one of the things that we do. I mean, this seminal work by uh, Peter Grofman and others talking about the fact that a lawn in, in the arid west uh, isn't that different from a lawn in uh, eastern part of US uh, as compared to their native vegetation. So humans homogenize landscape uh, response. Now, with the case of nitrogen, one of the reasons we said that this homogenization happens 
is because of this idea of uh, nutrient legacies. So what we are arguing for here is that um, you're putting in fertilizers multiple years in a landscape and this fertilizer addition builds up these legacy stores of nutrients in the landscape that buffers the episodicity of the concentrations and make it more chemostatic. Now, and so we go from having a supply limited landscape to a more transport limited system. Now, this is where some of our modeling comes into play. We develop simple models, box models to kind of um, uh, explore this hypothesis, like, do you need that big pool to create chemostasis? And we found that this was indeed true. The other thing that this showed us is, so when you think about uh, legacy nitrogen, a lot of times the legacy nitrogen, the first thing that comes to mind is nitrate dissolved in groundwater, because that's how we are conditioned to think about nitrogen. And what we found using our simple models is there is no way just groundwater nitrate will lead to that chemostatic behavior. You will need to have legacy also being built up in the soil organic matter. Now, this was not a very popular hypothesis at that point. It's well known that you have phosphorus legacies build up in soils. Are there nitrogen legacies building up in soil? So we went literally uh, digging for data. Uh, with, uh, with colleagues who were soil scientists. So these are two sites, one in Illinois and a set of studies in Iowa done with collaborators at Iowa State where soil cores were taken in a similar location as, as they were taken in the 1950s and they were planted uh, by uh, corn soybean. And what, was, what came out through that data synthesis was that when you have agriculture, the top 20 centimeters or so, there's a depletion of soil organic nitrogen, but between 20 centimeter to 100 centimeter, we were seeing a buildup of soil organic nitrogen in these systems. And then we complemented this analysis by a larger scale analysis with the NCSS, the National Cooperative Soil Survey data, and found a similar pattern that you were seeing this buildup of legacy nitrogen in the soils in these systems. And just to give you an idea of magnitude, typical corn soybean fields gets about 100 to 150 kilograms of nitrogen per year the accumulation magnitudes we were seeing were significant. They were about a third of that value. And since then, others have worked on it and there's been evidence of nitrogen legacy in accumulated in different regions. So, and this is also a really interesting study talking about legacies of carbon and nitrogen. They, this study looked at urban areas uh, around the world. And what they found was that if you looked at native uh, landscapes and side-by-side uh, -side urban landscapes, specifically when you're looking at these uh, smaller suburban landscapes, you see a buildup of carbon in these landscapes. And again, think about your fertilizers applied on your lawns that you're seeing this buildup of these legacies. Now, legacies are everywhere. So here we are talking about soil, but if you think about phosphorus, there's also legacy phosphorus that's accumulated in, in reservoirs and in lakes. Um, so this is more recent work uh, with a postdoc in the group, Richie Patacharya, where we are doing a meta-analysis of uh, legacy phosphorus accumulated in reservoirs and figuring out trajectories of sediment legacy accumulation. These are four typical trajectories and linking it to landscape inputs with the overall goal of saying, can we say how much legacy phosphorus has accumulated in our reservoirs? Um, so I'm going to jump forward now, but kind of leave you with this idea that these legacies are everywhere. And if you want to manage it, we have to measure it. We have to know how much is it and what, which landscape element has how much legacy. And there's a lot to be done in this space still. But kind of moving back into the space of what does it mean? So um, based on this, one of our hypotheses is that because of these legacy accumulation, a lot of times you will see water quality taking a longer time to respond. And this is not only true uh, in US, this is US, Canada, North America, everywhere you go. Um, we've been putting in a lot of time, energy, money uh, for watershed conservations to clean up our rivers, uh, but water quality still remains bad. And one of the reasons that happens is because of these legacy accumulation. Now, so from 
CQ relationship, concentration dis relation, discharge relationship to the space of legacy. And this is a point in my career where um, I was talking a lot about legacies and uh, had a couple of interviews with the local radio station in Waterloo. And one morning at 6 a.m., I had gone there to give a talk. And the person who was interviewing me saw me walk in and said, oh, she's going to tell us the depressing story again that nothing we do matters. And that was a very, uh, I, I think that was a turning point in the way I wanted to think about things. And um, so, so this is where the, the third part of kind of where I'm going, I feel, comes into play. Instead of talking about legacies, um, can we manage them for water quality improvement? Like, and what is the path for doing that? Which is, um, which is kind of uh, some of the things I will talk about in the rest of the talk. So the first thing in that path is kind of putting the psychiatrist hat on. Like if you go to psychotherapists, they'll tell you the first thing about a problem is acknowledging it. And it is kind of trivial. It is kind of trivial about that. But uh, in, in my interactions with uh, extension agents and policymakers, a lot of times I've been told, don't talk about legacies. Because if you tell people that it will take 15 years, there will be no action. And I think it's an important point to take home. How do we talk about legacies in a way that does not deter progress? Because the other side of that story is if you do not talk about legacies and you take action and nothing happens, then it looks like you don't know what you're doing. And so, so I think it's really important to, instead of ignoring legacies, thinking about quantifying them and thinking about addressing them head on. So that's kind of what, a lot of our work focuses on. And in order to kind of think about it, break it up into parts, it's just in a really simple box and narrow way, stores and fluxes, how much legacy is there? That's a big science gap. We don't know the answer to that. And the other is how are they mobilized? So this is where a change in climate comes into play. When you have these stores of legacy, increasing intensity of extreme events will mobilize these legacies into our water bodies. Um, in order to answer that question, the front end of the question, how much is there? Some of the work that we've been doing is this long-term mass budgets, thinking about how much nitrogen and phosphorus um, has been building up in our landscape uh, using agricultural census and other data set. Um, again, a little bit of a, a diversion about the homogenization hypothesis. One of the things that that led us to is realized that similar to lawns and ag fields, the nitrogen cycling in ag fields across the climate gradient is much more homogenous than the com comparative uh, urban com counterparts. So similarly, we are homogenizing also our agricultural landscapes um, across the country. So then moving forward to say, well, there are legacies in the landscape. Why does it matter? So here's a simple way of thinking about it. What you see on the left side is uh, the relationship between nitrogen inputs and nitrogen loads in streams. And each data point is an average for that particular watershed. And this has been in the literature for many decades. Um, and what that tells you is that as you decrease nitrogen inputs, your nitrogen loads would decrease. But now let's take any one of those data point and kind of zoom it in time. So for any one watershed, you can also track the nitrogen inputs and outputs over time. So this is one watershed. And here you see this interesting pattern that as your increasing inputs out loads are increasing, but as your decreasing inputs, loads are also increasing. So this is this idea of, of um, legacy inputs in the landscape and the role of these legacy inputs um, in sustaining a high, high uh, nutrient load in the system. And this is really important from a management perspective because, hey, you're putting in all these effort to reduce fertilizer input to the landscape, but then you measure nitrogen in your stream and loads are increasing, that creates a lot of confusion. So it's really important to understand that. And these relationships, are different for different watersheds. So here's another in Denmark where it's beautiful linear relationship. So we really have to study it spatially to really understand what's happening in the system. So that's some of the work 
that's ongoing in the group. We've looked across uh, US and now moving more and more towards uh, gathering more Canadian data to look across it in, in Canada too. Um, and we find these classes of response. One of it is lagged response. So this is the scenario when nitrogen inputs are decreasing, but loads are still high. And these are anti-clockwise hysteresis loops, so they're like that. And then we also see examples of accelerated response, so clockwise hysteresis loops, again, across the country. And we are trying to ask this question, what creates the differences in these patterns? So what you see on that map over here, this is work done by Kim Van Meter at Penn State. And she's been looking at these patterns and found these three classes of response, lagged, accelerated, and linear behavior. And what you see on, the, uh, on this uh, image is on the Eastern part of the US, there's a lot more of these accelerated behavior. Midwest is a lot more um, uh, lagged behavior. So it's spatially varying uh, across the system. And we're now kind of trying to tease out these signals to say what drives this behavior. Um, one of the drivers is input. So what you see over here is um, nitrogen inputs across, across the country. And you see these different kinds of input trajectories. So in some places, like the C1, you have these peaks that happened in the 1970s, 80s. And this is a lot of the Eastern US that had the peaks in these forested watershed and, and they have been decreasing because of decrease in atmospheric deposition. Whereas in other areas, you see this monotonic increase in input. So a lot of the patterns that we see is a function of that input trajectory. So that's one of the drivers. The second driver is landscape driven. So landscape driven drivers are however really hard to tease out. And this is again where um, we use models. So in this case, one of the things we looked at was using a model to say, as you increase the travel time in a watershed, what happens to that loop, that hysteresis loop? And what we find is that the loop becomes wider as the travel time increases. Kind of obvious, but we can actually quantify it now. The other thing that we found that was kind of interesting was the effect of tile rains. And what we found is that the tile rains squish that loop behavior. And again, tiles create this really fast pathway of the of the nitrogen uh, to uh, move through the system. And what we see is that the hysteresis index that captures how wide this loop is um, really smushes down when, um, when you have tile drains in the system. So this is one kind of path where we are really looking at past data to understand what drives the inputs and outputs in the system. Now, from a policy perspective, there's also the forward-looking question. And the forward-looking question is when you make a change in the landscape, how long will it take for the water quality to improve? And to answer these questions, what we need is models. And this is what brings into the next part of our work, which is developing this model. Um, and we call this model element uh, exploration of long-term nutrient trajectories. Um, and the idea, so of course, there's a gazillion water quality models out there, so why another model? And one of the things that we recognized when we were looking at water quality models is um, that they do space really well, but they do not do legacy that well. So what do I mean by that? So let's say I have a plot of land, and let's say it is a forested plot of land. So if I put it into a model like SWOT, any, any watershed model, uh, it will tell you that because it's forested, the nitrogen concentrations um, in that plot of land that's leaching would not be that high. Now, what if this was a cropland that has been restored to forest? For those of us who have had experience in sampling some of these systems, we know that we can get really high nitrate concentrations under those planted forests. So the memory matters. The modeling framework that we are using, what we do is uh, instead of just uh, breaking up a landscape into these units of space, we break them up into units of space and time. So a plot of land that is forested now, if its memory is different than another plot of land, will get a different designation and will capture that memory. So at the essence, in a philosophical way, what the modeling effort says memory matters. Right, and we capture that in a mod in the modeling framework. And if anybody is interested, I can go into further details. Uh, it's a process-based model apart from that. So we have carbon nitrogen cycling in the organic soil, and uh, travel time distribution for the groundwater pathway. 
And we've been using this model for multiple watershed. This, is, this was one of the first applications where we looked at uh, the Mississippi River Basin. And we used this model to answer the question, uh, how long will it take to achieve a 60% reduction in uh, nitrogen load in the Mississippi River Basin? And in this case, the results of the model was that it will take about 35 years or so. And of course, I'm not saying it won't be 35 or 30 or 40, but the point being that it will be of the order of decades that you will see an impact. Of course, that's the impact at the outlet of the Mississippi. And the only thing that we are talking about here is nutrient management in your cropland to reduce that nitrogen surplus. There's other pieces of the story, which I'll come to later. We've also developed this model for phosphorus. Um, I'll talk less about phosphorus today than nitrogen, but we've been kind of moving parallelly with nitrogen and phosphorus in this work. Uh, the nuance with phosphorus, of course, is that you have to really capture erosion and deposition in, in reservoirs. You have to capture the urban component much better. Uh, so there is phosphorus that goes to landfill. So we're really building up that phosphorus budget to be able to do this in these systems. Um, and so we ran the phosphorus model for, um, for a watershed in, in the Lake Erie Basin. And one of the key takeaways from that is this huge mass of legacy phosphorus that's building up in soil. And again, um, this is where data comes into play. We are working with colleagues now to say, can we validate some of these numbers? And if they are very off, then can we re do the models to come at it. So again, modeling, there's only so much you can go. You need data from different angles to constrain your models. The other thing that we found, again, is this idea of reservoirs and riparian zones and the mass of uh, accumulation that's, that's going on there. And again, this needs data to validate some. The other interesting thing about this is, is this finding that since 1900, less than 4% of the nitrogen inputs has shown up. The rest of it is there as legacy nitrogen. And this is important when we think about improvements in water quality. If that's so much there, what is it that we can do? Um, in this case, one of the main finding from the models was the biggest impact that one can have in this watershed is through livestock manure. And that's because uh, livestock manure is one of the biggest component, but also that's one of the components that could be managed to get the fastest improvements in water quality. And I would ask you to hold on to that idea because there's other work that we did later that actually um, confirmed some of these. Okay, so after I bored you to death with legacies, the next part is thinking, well, there are legacies in the landscape. There's nothing we can do about it. Can we think about using it as a resource? And this is where kind of, again, is this all a bad story? And this is where uh, there's a ton of work that's ongoing and, and um, thinking about um, the source of uh, the nitrogen that's picked up by the crop. So this is a paper that came out in Global Change Biology. This is uh, based on isotope data, uh, a meta-analysis. And what they found was that less than half of the nitrogen taken up by crops is derived from th this year's fertilizers, past fertilizers that is being picked up. What that means is that here we have this opportunity of applying less fertilizer and, and really harvesting that legacy nitrogen. And um, this is a study from, um, from near Waterloo um, where it's, it's a really interesting story where there's, there's this groundwater well that had high nitrate concentrations and it was high enough so that the city that was reliant on that groundwater well needed to build a water treatment plant. And they decided that instead of building a water treatment plant, they were going to lease out a circle of land around the well and uh, they have to the fertilizer and manure application on that circle of land and they paid the farmers for it. And they found that groundwater nitrate concentrations went down. It was a 10 year or so project. And, um, but the interesting thing is there was absolute no reduction in crop yield with half the amount of fertilizers that were being applied on that land. So there's a tremendous potential there. Similarly with phosphorus, uh, it has been found that you can reduce phosphorus by 50, 60%, but you do not see an impact on crop yield, but water quality improves. So this is where there is an opportunity. What is missing 
is of course to be able to say this for every field. So we really, there's, there's huge um, progress that's ongoing recently using remote sensing and other data to understand variability in nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil, precision agriculture, the world of precision agriculture to be able to apply less. But at the same time, what is needed is more policy and structural changes to make that happen. And maybe the increase in fertilizer prices will do it, who knows. But part of the thing is that there is, the solution is there, but it needs to be um, mobilized at scale. The three other pieces uh, within that path is one is spatially targeted measures. And it's really important to really understand the spatial variability. And this is not something we do in conservation practices in North America. It's all, everything is done on a voluntary basis. And given resources are limited, it's really important to think about these targeting. The other piece of it is diversifying monitoring. Given that we have legacies in the landscape, there is going to be 10, 15 years before we will see impact. Can we diversify monitoring to find evidence of success? So for example, if you're applying less fertilizer on the soil, can we measure N2O emissions to see its impact rather than always waiting for that pulse to show up in the river? And the last piece is coupling short and long-term measures. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about the nitrogen story, um, you can do nutrient management to reduce the nitrogen that's going to leach to your streams or groundwater. But the horse that has already left the burn, the groundwater nitrogen, that's still going to come through your system. And the only way to deal with it is more downstream measures. So wetlands and riparian areas that intercept that water. So you really think, you have to think about different pools of legacy and how different practices can impact different pools of legacy in a spatially targeted way. So this is kind of my um, journey from, from the space of diagnosing and modeling water quality problems to thinking about uh, solutions, water quality solutions that address multiple sustainable development goals. And I wanna talk a little bit about the space today because I feel myself really uh, motivated by the space. And, and one of the ways, and this is partly my, um, my training has been always as an environmental engineer. And I've ran far, far away from really traditional engineering space. But I feel this is the first time the science and engineering is coming together a little bit. So really thinking about solutions, but thinking about solutions as I would, in, in a very um, kind of uh, data-driven way. So really trying to understand these patterns from data and kind of coming from that to, to understand what solutions uh, might work. So this idea of solution scapes, uh, this is a new project starting off. So if anybody is interested, uh, I'd love to talk more. To think about these solutions that address multiple sustainable development goals. So what do, you, what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about wetland restoration for water quality, well, wetlands also sequester carbon. They also have greenhouse gas impacts. And this idea that when you want to think about these solutions, you want to think about them in a holistic way. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the things uh, we plan to do in this project, thinking about wetland restoration, manure to bioenergy. I told you, I think one of the things that I feel very inspired by is the space of that and farm con conservation. So. Jumping right into wetlands um, in terms of an idea of um, how, how um, uh, some of these things could be thought about. So for wetlands, I mean, we know wetlands retain excess nutrients and uh, improve water quality. But the question that we were interested in asking is what is the role of wetland size in nutrient removal and what does it mean in terms of nutrient removal potential of wetlandscapes? Um, so we started out by again, doing a massive data synthesis across wetlands across the world and finding out what drives uh, wetland nutrient retention. And one of the things that we found that was interesting is this idea of inverse relationship between size of a wetland and its denitrification kinetics. So the idea is that smaller wetlands, like small streams, are more effective in uh, nitrogen removal than larger wetlands and the, on a per unit area basis. And the reason we hypothesize is because that small wetlands have higher sediment area to water ratio, just like small streams, which provides more space for uh, all these uh, 
processes to happen. So equipped with that, we then wanted to say, well, how much nitrogen is removed by wetlands across the US? And we took the empirical relationships that we had, we grouped them with a wetland density map to come up with a percent nitrogen removal map across US. And that's what you see in purple over there, where the darker areas are more percent removal. Now, just because there is potential doesn't mean it will be realized. So what is the source of nitrogen in these systems? And in this case, we wanted to link these sources we sinks. Here we bring in our nitrogen input data sets. So these are mass balance studies where we're saying what are the fertilizer and nitrogen inputs. And we take these two pieces together to answer the question, how much nitrogen is removed by wetlands across the US? And in this case, we found that without existing wetlands, nitrogen loads in the Mississippi River Basin would be 50% higher than they are today. And of course, there's tremendous uncertainty in that 50% number. But one of the reasons why I think this is important to say is it provides a number rather than saying, oh, let's protect the wetlands that we have. It provides a concrete number in a space where uh, hypoxia in the Mississippi River Basin is one of the big challenges that we are uh, contending with. So moving forward, we then ask the question, how can wetland restoration contribute to improvements in water quality? And again, going back to the toolkit that um, I'm most comfortable with, we developed these models of wetland restoration across the country. So the first one was we are saying, well, we are going to randomly restore wetlands all across the country. The bluish color is not very clear over here, but basically, we restore 10% uniformly across the country. Second scenario, we said, uh, well, there will be no net agricultural land loss, so we never put a wetland in an ag land. And the third scenario where we said we are going to do targeted restoration. So we're going to restore wetlands in the, those heavy ag areas that have uh, large nutrient inputs. And we looked at a whole range of increase in wetland area. And the essence of what we found is that targeted restoration leads to 40 times more nitrogen removal than non-targeted restoration. And of course, it's a higher cost because ag land is much more expensive, uh, but it's only double the cost. Now, again, this provides a number to say, well, how much more? And that you, you really want to think about targeted restoration if you want to address uh, the nitrogen removal challenge. And broadly, we found that a targeted 22% increase in wetland area led to a 40% decrease in nitrogen loads. Now, there's also co-benefits and trade-offs of wetland restoration. For example, wetlands are sources of greenhouse gases. And uh, so if you restore a whole bunch of wetlands, will you solve or create another problem while trying to solve one? What are these benefits and trade-offs and how do they vary across space? The other part of wetlands is biodiversity. And if you're thinking about uh, restoring wetlands for biodiversity, do you really want to restore those ag wetlands or would you rather restore wetlands in more pristine areas? So this project that I was talking about kind of tries to address these questions based on available data and methods. What are the key trade-offs associated with restoration? What spatial patterns of restoration can lead to the greatest synergies? And finally, how can policies and incentives be uh, better designed to ensure greater farmer participation in restoration? Okay, I'm going to jump topics again in the last 10 minutes to, to talk to you about yet another space where, uh, where this kind of data synthesis had led us into a space where, where we are exploring a solution. So this is the data from the Great Lakes Basin, and we've been harmonizing and synthesizing some of the data. And one of the things that was really interesting with this data set is this finding that soluble phosphorus has been increasing ubiquitously across the basin, while total phosphorus has been decreasing. So TP change percent is in the last two decades how much total phosphorus has been changing, and SRP is how much soluble phosphorus has been um, changing. Now, people have seen this in, in a couple agricultural watersheds in the Lake Erie Basin, but this is now looking across the entire basin 
400 watersheds, and we see this pattern. And what we see is that if you look in this image over here, a 2D, and so what we see is that there are some in which both are increasing, a lot in which TP is decreasing, but phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus is increasing. And of course, there are some in which both are decreasing. You ask why, and that's one thing we have been grappling it. Why do we see this kind of pattern? And um, I'm not gonna go into all of the details today, but it's a mix of different reasons. One of the reasons what we found is uh, increasing livestock density uh, drives building up of soil phosphorus. And we see that when you have high livestock density, you actually see a higher proportion of bioavailable phosphorus that's coming out from the landscape. And it's well known that uh, li uh, livestock contributes to build up of soil test phosphorus and possibly that's what's happening. The other pattern is increasing tile drains. So the first one is source. The second one is the transport pathway. The tile, when, when water flows through the tiles, uh, it's leaching the, uh, the absorbed phosphorus on the soil and, and making it available. And of course, there is the climate where you have now more and more increasing winter storms where you have these uh, thawing events. And when you have thawing events, the ground thaws, so you don't have a lot of surface runoff events, which bring in your particulate phosphorus. You are getting more of these subsurface pathways activated and you get more dissolved phosphorus in the system. So that's our hypothesis about one of the reasons why, why you're getting more, more prefer preferentially dissolved phosphorus increasing. But again, this has tremendous implications in terms of algal blooms in not only the five great lakes, but also a lot of the small lakes and reservoirs in the basin, because if our dissolved phosphorus is increasing, temperatures are increasing, stratification patterns are changing, we are going to see more and more algal blooms in these systems. So last piece is the manure, biogas, and water quality. So if indeed livestock is one of the biggest challenges. There is, is also a solution to think about how to think about livestock systems. And in terms of these trade-offs, one of the things that we are really interested in exploring is, is bioenergy. The benefit of bioenergy is you get increased power generation, but you also get reduced greenhouse gas emissions and potentially improvement in water quality. So what we're trying to explore in that space is Spatially figuring out where do you want the biodigesters to be if you have many sources in the landscape and what are these trade-offs uh, associated with transporting manure and food waste to bio, uh, biodigesters and what are the optimal locations? So again, the same idea between whether you're thinking about wetlands or whether you're thinking of biodigesters, space is important. And the other is trade-offs is important. So kind of having these ideas run through these systems to really think about these landscape scale solutions. With that, I wanted to thank you for your time and your patience. Thank my amazing uh, lab group. Um, I think to me, science is much more about the people uh, than anything else. So I would uh, want to start by thanking them. And then kind of just summarizing a little bit, I started out with this bold claim of science to policy. Um, and it's, it's more a story about my path. Um, impacting policy is a long way to go. Um, and so we started with thinking about um, looking across multiple sites, thinking about what drives this variability in concentration. And that kind of led us to this path of thinking about uh, nutrient legacies, which led us to this path of thinking about uh, solutions to these challenges and really kind of trying to ground these solutions or the way we think about these solutions or target these solutions from, from data and constantly update the way in which we think about these solutions from the space of synthesizing data. Data synthesis is one of the things that I think, I feel like that's the part of science that I love more than uh, anything else. And, and I feel that kind of being able to uh, link that to, to things that matter um, is, is something that has uh, motivated me. And coming back to the space of LTR, which is why I think uh, the work done within this amazing um, group, is, it's, just, it's just so mind boggling being able to synthesize and work with data across multiple sites and multiple systems and draw insights that are meaningful across scales and systems. With that, thank you for your time and I'd love to take questions.
We have microphones in the aisle for folks who have questions. Yeah. I think it's nice for a great talk of walking this year because it's easy to grab and find up for nice and parking. So, if you don't know how much you can park, this is a great tool for how to sign in and form policy and decision making. And I think, you know, of our experience at NPL, that we know that farmers put lots of process on it to be safe. And so, ultimately, then, all the science is great, we know that comes in. But how has your experience been taking the science and getting it so in the right hands for people to make decisions or change the policy? Thank you so much, Emily, for that question. Um, this is one of the things that I'm um, really excited about in this part of the work. Um, so, so, kind of a short answer to that is that. Um, in a lot of ways, that's the part that's really hard. How do you get farmers to apply less fertilizers? Um, and, and I think the solution to that question might come from the space of larger scales policies and incentive structures that need to change effectively. That was me. <laughs> and, um, I am nowhere an expert in, in, in that space, but I do talk to people who are. And one of the things that's this, this, it's intriguing is, is this idea that, okay, there is no, not going to be much loss in crop yields if you apply less, but how do you know? How do you really know? So questions about whether our insurance structures, whether our crop insurance structures should have things in place that make it possible um, to yeah. fail for the farmers to be able to. So I think there's a ton of kind of innovation in design of policies and incentive structures uh, to make that happen. But I also think uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of say that there's two pieces of this puzzle, right? One is how much fertilizer a farmer is putting on his landscape. And I think that's the toughest piece of uh, the needle to move. Um, but the other piece, if you think about livestock operations, a lot of, at least one, what we saw, a lot of the times when you see high phosphorus concentration, it has to do with over application of manure because you have bigger livestock facilities and you're not disposing at all. So to me, that is a low hanging fruit because there are fewer people involved and it's possible technically to make that manure to bioenergy may be more feasible by having different set of um, um, subsidies for RNG, for example. So there's other ways to come at it. And in some ways, I feel that the livestock is probably the low hanging fruit we should put more attention to. So I also have a few questions. Um, so you have really taken on a fairly articulated some of the greatest challenges we face in terms of the farm. Uh, so the farm is just one of the Work, yes. right? I mean, so how do you get there? We have a lot of uh, race training for conveying the question of, okay, well, yes, you're going to spend a lot of money um, to address the problem, send it work before it's better. Right. And, and you, know, you see it with not only the process and agricultural license, but we also work in urban and so we have a salt problem. So, so can you do one on um, so, so, so there's a couple questions we have to leave on training. Yes, so it is it is a really tough um, question. I don't know if I have a good answer for it. I would say through the IJC, one of the things that I've seen, the phosphorus legacy part of it has, after so many years of people talking about it, has kind of seeped into um, uh, understanding, but I also, this is part of the reason I uh, I like the idea, and with salt, I don't know how to do that, but with nitrogen and phosphorus, I like the idea of framing it as a resource within the landscape, and it will lower, lower your costs um, if you could do it right. So I think figuring out ways of framing uh, is, is non-trivial and um, and important. So, so with nitrogen and phosphorus, that helps, I think, uh, a little bit more. Thank you for this talk. Um, I'm Chip Small, MSP LTER. 
and since Emily didn't ask a phosphorus question, I guess I will. Um, yeah, so we actually, we do have a, a workshop tomorrow morning um, thinking about um, legacy phosphorus and LTER data sets. And you started um, showing, by showing some LTER data from, you know, that you used 10, 12 years ago. Um, and, and I'm just curious, you know, a lot of the LTER sites maybe um, you don't have the same levels of anthropogenic nutrient loading that some of the agricultural systems that you've you've uh, worked in more recently with the, these modeling efforts. But um, do you think there's still value in some of these data sets in terms of understanding nutrient retention in different conditions and how environmental control, you know, what, what can we use these LTER data sets um, to do to help us understand these larger problems of nutrient retention? Absolutely, thank you for the question. I'd start out by saying we would not have come to the space of saying legacies are important if we did not have LTER data, right? Because the LTER data showed us that in small watersheds, you're not seeing this linear behavior, you're seeing a lot of like, and, and that tells you that the legacy is not driving it. So a lot of times, so that was kind of the entire space of legacies that have moved away from LTER site um, was, was informed by that space with that LTER data. But moving forward, I mean, one of the ways to think about these, and, and this is where kind of the kinds of data at LTR become really important, is processes. I mean, there's only so much you can do with this large watershed data in terms of processes. You can come up, you do, I mean, the, the, what I showed was product of some machine learning models. You do all of that, and, and, and then you wave your hands wildly up in the air because there's only so much that you know about a large watershed to say anything concrete. With the LTR, you have these constrained systems, and that allows you to kind of tease out some of these, some of these responses much better than, than what you can do. So I think work should always be complementary in terms of processes and small site and data and models on small site really understanding the process and at the same time larger scale to see if some of those ideas um, translate. And historically, even the tracking would have lacked some fresh water down the um, But now that the drought conditions have been persistent for many crop And so we get these semi arid systems that are lasting on the nitrogen down to keep things around, but we don't have water. Um, I just didn't know if you had any thoughts. Um, I guess I'm asking for definite hypothesis, <laughs> but um, if you have any tools in the water. I do not know the answer to that question. <laughs> I do not want to hazard a guest on in here. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, I, I'm wondering if I can try to connect two things. You can get to the deep data that. Um, when you, I thought one of the good things you talked about was the value that you should put on the weapon. From quantifying the reason that it's like the reality of the past, maybe I would feel like what, but um, I'm wondering how to tie that to a anecdote that um, can improve the story of the story. Because I see a glimmer of hope there. So I'm just kind of wondering how you pertain, you really have some thoughts, but how do you pertain to sort of the, the broader public? So, uh, Mike, can you repeat the last part of the question? I somehow missed it, the bad news part of it. Well, so you, you, you made the anecdote about going into the radio interview. And right. Said, oh, just, right, um, right. So how do you, how do you present to the, uh, to the lay public from the public when she didn't get to do anything like that? Um, what can be done? And so that you're not just doing that. No, so that that actually kind of that was what launched me in this path question of wetlands and and all the solution space and part of it I think I should clarify. Um, so so when I started with that work with the Mississippi Basin and I said, uh, well, it will take three decades for the water quality to improve. Um, in that space, the 
the only, in our model, the only management we were doing is reducing the nitrogen surplus. So basically saying farm scale management where you are reducing fertilizer input uh, or, or um, but then the reason it was taking so long, again, is because of the horse that has left the barn. But this is where the wetlands do come into play. So if you add wetlands to the system strategically, then you can actually reduce that 30 years time frame. And that's kind of how those two pieces go together uh, to make the point that, that uh, you need more downstream measures. And it is possible to have these small wetlands that are uh, maybe um, distributed across the landscape at outlets of tile drains um, to, to treat it before, uh, before it shows up. So, so that's kind of the two parts of it is that the three decade estimate is not adding any of the wetlands, it's just reducing the um, farm scale. But it is always a constant, I think it's always a challenge. And, um, and again, thinking about like the positive spins on the story to, but if you think about it, the other part of it that I've been thinking about is if you think about not our world, but the world of climate action. Well, this, the, the part of, like what we do today will take a long time for, to get the to get the two degrees. It, that's there in that uh, space, and we accept it. I think a lot more in the climate space than we accept it in the water space, because in the water space, I feel that we have been spoiled by what Clean Water Act and point source controls have done to our water system, where we've seen this very fast improvement. And now we want similar things for the non-point, but the challenge is very similar to the climate challenge is we've done it and it will take some time. So I think, I think as a community, um, we, um, we, we have to keep, keep at it. And again, because of that, the climate space also suffers from action. Um, so I, I don't know if I can give a right answer, but it's just a rambling way to say it is, it is hard. Um, there's, there's a really interesting uh, paper that came out um, that talked about eutrophication in the Roman era. So they actually did sediment course to track it back. And it's only recently that the signal has gone away uh, from, from, from a eutrophication event during that time. So talk about time scales. <laughs> a metaphor for the hard work that we do in activity completion. So I think about my graph, it says that you remove the point source, maybe you remove what the lab action things get better. But really it's just likely that when we get into the work of activity injustice, it's gonna get harder. It's gonna feel harder. But we have to persist sort of through this long to clean clockwise thing. Um, to get to where we want to be. I feel like I just want to feel like this watershed graph. <laughs> Thank you. That is beautiful. And so true. Thank you so much for sharing that. Hi, that was an amazing talk. I love hearing you talk. Um, my name is Kathy Jo Jankowski, and I uh, work in the Mississippi River Basin, so this is all very close to home for me. But um, one of the things we're facing is a lot higher flows and more extreme events, like so many of the LTR systems. And I was at a meeting with a bunch of the mayors from the Mississippi Rivers and Towns last week, and a big thing that they're concerned about is these higher flows and what that's going to do to their um, cities that, you know, economically benefit from the Mississippi River. So I was curious as you're sort of planning these different types of solutions, um, especially, you know, in terms of wetlands and how flow is going to change. Yeah, how are you thinking about climate and the sort of uh, predictions we have for the basin? So climate is one of the biggest factors. I mean, so if you think about, I mean, the intersection of legacy with climate is one of the scary parts of the story because you have these legacy stores of phosphorus, for example, build up in our landscape and you get more extreme events uh, that leads to greater, uh, greater mobilization um, uh, of them. And then once they show up in our lakes, now we have higher temperatures, so we get more algal blooms, so it's a double whammy. Um, so, so I think um, it is, it is, it is, uh, it is a challenge in terms of um, in terms of thinking about uh, thinking about it. And and one of the one of the things is when uh, 
so when I talk about legacies, a lot of times people have said, but that's the past. But legacy is not about the past. It is about a changing climate because it is that pool in the landscape that's impacting uh, the future future events. And part of it is we don't know how these uh, extreme events and the timing of it will impact our water bodies. Um, so you mentioned during your talk that um, really powerful modeling tools and synthetic tools require some amount of data to work with. Um, I'm you know, the first to try to grapple back to assess the effectiveness of what the station will have on the treatment level. Um, I'm wondering where do you see are the biggest data gaps? Like where is that well the data need to inform these models and synthetic? So um, I think one of the things, and we've been looking into it a little bit, so all the stuff that I presented is kind of these annual average nutrient removal rates. Nutrients don't get removed in an annual average way. So we really need to understand the temporal dynamics. Um, and we, we did a meta-analysis trying to pull together temporally varying data sets, and a lot of times they don't exist. Uh, or even if they exist, they are not reported. So I think we really need to understand because wetlands can flip between sources and sinks during a year. Um, and and um, there's a set of wetlands in Waterloo we've been monitoring and you can see uh, the source behavior. So what drives the source behavior? And it differs across the landscape. So we really need to kind of understand, have enough data at different regions, different climate across time to understand what drives, uh, whether they are sources or sinks and when they are sources. So thanks for a wonderful talk. I want to get back to precision agriculture and its relationship with movements like landscape ecology and decoding policy. I have family back in South Dakota, and uh, I know farmers like to buy new tractors, <laughs> right? And uh, the precision agriculture, John Deere and company really advancing very quickly using GPS. So, could you figure out which farmers in the federal government are going to buy them new tractors if they? Need less nitrogen phosphorus. Who should we buy? Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's a good one. So no, not with my model. Not with our model. But but I do think, uh, I mean, this is where it becomes more politics and policy. I think there is huge amount of data, both to be harnessed, like all these tractors, and you can get crop yield data technically from this. So there's huge amounts of data that exists that if we had access to more as a community, there's tremendous understanding that could be increased tremendous, but we don't. And, and that limits uh, limits kind of our understanding of the spatial variability of these patterns. So just as, as a kind of anecdotal story. So we've been working with this group in Netherlands and, and Denmark. And one, that, one of the things that I learned is that in Denmark, um, if, uh, if you get, if, if manure is produced on your farm, it leaves your farm, there's a GPS on, um, on, the track, uh, on the truck that leaves the farm. So they know from each farm where every piece of uh, manure is going at what time. So that's the kind of data and that data is available. So, so part of the thing is that for us, um, I'll tell you another funny story about data. So for example, um, if I, I keep saying manure because again, I think that is really important. We really don't have locations of uh, uh, operations. And so in a project right now, we are working with somebody from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, and they do have data for every burn, but he is not allowed to access the data. So he and I and an undergraduate student, we are using remote sensing to identify burn locations, though that data sits there. 
So it's really interesting how the politics and policies of the dis, uh, this plays out and what that means in terms of our ability to manage sustainably. So I think So I think if we don't have any more questions right now, let's just thank Nandita again for an amazing talk. And she's going to be around for the rest of the week. So uh, if you appreciated the talk, uh, buy her a, a beverage at the patio and, uh, and follow up then. Thank you so much again. Really enjoyed.